Coach Spiker, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast today. Hope all is well. How are things for you right now? I know you're in the office. Got some nice books in the background there. Back on <laughs> campus. Got a nice collection, man. What, what are on those shelves back there? Hey, if you don't, if you don't show books, if you don't have a show books on your, uh, on your, uh, when you're doing a, a podcast, right? You're not doing anything. So, no. Um, reading a book right now by Jerome Allen, uh, When the Alphabet Comes, former head coach at Penn. He's current assistant coach of the Celtics. Uh, we're reading it as a team. And uh, so it's been, it's been a uh, – we just started and uh, trying to read. Uh, coach Jordan is helping lead our discussions and uh, go through it. But it's uh, been a good book. So also got one, Why the Best of the Best, from Kevin Eastman. He's a longtime coach and executive in the NBA right now. And uh, try and read like a chapter a day with that. Um, it's uh, – yesterday was about intention, the difference between intentions and being intentional. And uh, kind of shared that with our guys. Intentions are what you write down on a piece of paper, like a goal, right? Or here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to accomplish. Um, intentional is what you do every day to reach that. And uh, it's way more important to be intentional than to have good intentions. Good intentions are nice. That's the start. Uh, but being intentional. So uh, my father um, taught me and my parents to be more specific, but uh, always, you know, if you're going to be a leader, you need to be a reader. And a uh, simple phrase, uh, readers are leaders and leaders are readers. So uh, you got to spend some time um, feeding, feeding your brain and, and, and learning things to, to motivate your group and to, to look at things from different perspectives. Well, it's so funny. That's what you do in pandemics. That's what you do in pandemics. A lot of time and thought. <laughs> a, lot of time, a lot of time and thought in some random places in your house that you never thought you'd sit in for a long time. Right. Uh, certainly, that's an example. And if you, you know, deal with any type of uh, work stoppage or pause, you even got more time <laughs> to evaluate. <laughs> well, hey, it's, that's kind of what the year's been for me. I'm reading a book now, actually. I just read the first chapter last night. It's called Limitless by a guy named Jim Quick. He's a brain expert. And it's so funny, he uses the exact sign, uh, exact uh, phrase that you just said that leaders are readers. And so uh, for you, and maybe not just for you, but for your team, because it sounds like over the years, you've probably had, had books assigned to, te uh, to teams of the past, to players of the past. How important is that for you as a group to come together over those, those bonding principles? And how big of a part of your program is it to have pieces of literature shared with, with players and coaches in your program? Yeah, you know, it's funny, Chris. I, I think this is the first time that we've straight up said, hey, we're going to take a book and do it. And, and Coach Jordan, who's joined our staff, has been a great addition to our staff, um, had done a couple times. And I've kind of deferred to his experiences and said, hey, let's do it. Um, so I haven't, per se, said, hey, we're going to read this book and walk through it as a team or a family. It's kind of how I see it. Um, but I do think sharing different things um, in small increments that are digestible for a, a young student athlete who um, time management may be the biggest developing skill um, in their world. Uh, knowing when to stop playing the game at night, um, you know, get off call of duty and get into bed or uh, Madden or social media is such a, uh, such a monster of, of engulfing, you know, mindless hours of time or schoolwork and sleep. So, um, I, I felt I haven't, so I haven't done books. This is the first time and I think it'll be really good for us, but I do believe instead of one great big 60 minute message to your team, um, there's more value in having 61 minute messages uh, and you sprinkle them out and about throughout the season, not that 60 is a number, just as an example. So, um, I do like articles. Uh, I do love, uh, finding the right things to bookmark is a, is a very popular function on my phone on Twitter, right? There's a handful of, uh, we probably all have our own routines. There's a handful of things that you use on a daily basis uh, to help your process go forward. Uh, and doing that is something, grab it, think it, hey, you might send it to your veterans, you might send it to a freshman. Um, so I think the, as I've done things each year, you know, differently, I I think you try and nuance it instead of maybe it's, you know, I'm kind of thinking out loud or here, but it may not be 61 minute messages to everybody. 
you know, it might be an individual message, you know, talking to, you know, guys from experiences and you have different experiences along the way that are just, Hey, let me tell you about this guy. You know, let me tell you about Adam Gore when I was an assistant coach at Cornell and his first couple months on campus. And listen, you just had that experience yesterday and you feel like you're the only first year player that's ever had that experience. And generationally or however you want to say it, I don't want to get too broad, but (laughs) you feel like you're the only one affected. And well, this happened 15 years ago in a different town to another college basketball player. Right. And that guy ended up being um, a rookie of the year. That guy ended up being a two-time Ivy League champion. And that guy ended up having a really unique career. So um, you, what you think is something unique to you might be something of, of a badge of honor in a very small elite group of people that uh, you connect with. Well, that makes sense. Oh, 100%. 100%. And you mentioned kind of the, the nuances and how it's changed for you over the years. This being, you know, going into – five years now at Drexel, but let's go back to the beginning for you. Growing up in, in Morgantown, West Virginia, you mentioned already how your parents instilled in you that leaders are readers coming up. Take me back to the early days, though, when basketball first enters the sphere for you, right? When was it that the game of basketball first came into your life, and how did the passion for it kind of develop over time? You know, I, I don't know that I have a good answer to that question. I just can't remember a time where it wasn't, right? right. And in particular, a little bit younger, it was every sport. It was every sport. If there was, if there was a, uh, I'm leaning in like I'm yelling, you know, like you can't hear. <laughs> Shows my age a little bit, right? Um, no, it's all good. I do it every now and then. Right, <laughs> But um, just growing up, I think it, it was whatever the season was. That was the sport we were playing. You know, I never really got into like full contact tackle football, but I loved playing it, loved watching it. And, right. Uh, was around that, but certainly soccer, basketball, baseball were the main sports. And uh, it was just a family that was around athletics and, and loved doing it. And at what point in time would you say you started considering go, going into coaching, right? For you, when, when is the idea of, okay, what I want to do the rest of my life is be a coach? When does that start to come to mind for you? Um, I, I remember at a, at a crazy young age and different scenarios that I really enjoyed about. I remember. Um, in third grade, there was a really good team in our league, and my sister um, kept the scorebook for the league. And I think we had lost maybe the year before to this team. And I, I knew that Stephen Dalton was a really good player. And I remember, so she had the scorebook for the whole season. So she'd work every Saturday and keep the scores. And I knew we were playing that team soon. And I remember grabbing the scorebook from her and going through the previous weeks to see how good Stephen Dalton was right early season. So I think that's a little bit of an indication. Like guy was making his own scouting report in grade school. (laughs) (laughs) Um, That that's a memory, right? I thought right there, we we did beat him. Um, um, But uh, yeah, those are, you had different thoughts like that, but I don't, I don't have like a, it wasn't like a light bulb moment. Um, right. I wanted to do it and um, spent a lot of summer working camps, driving around, trying to meet with different coaches um, and, and loved it. Loved it. I, well, it was, I was going to say, let me get on that question. Eight, week, eight weeks on. out of nine in the summer, just mm-hmm. different camps. And uh, that first summer out of college was, was awesome kind of had my own little routine I had like a little 12 inch TV that you plug you know you go stay in a different college dorm at Frostburg State or you go to UNC Charlotte you know every college has like a little cable hookup so it was like yeah a little you go around you work these camps you do some laundry laundromat you stick around right day in between but you had like a TV plugged in <laughs> it'd be awesome now with synergy and a laptop you could you get a lot of stuff done but uh, that was kind of kind of how I lived for a summer Right. And well, so when you're developing in those early days as a coach, who were some of the people you looked up to, right? What are some resources or, or some idols that you had, that people you wanted to aspire to be? And obviously, you, everybody grows into their own person. But I think we all start looking up to people, admiring certain qualities that they have and wanting to add that to our repertoire. Yeah. I'm looking up here for something. I may have it. Um, I'll get to it in a second here, I think. But uh, 
you know, I, I wanted to be around as many good coaches as I could be, right? So um, having a chance to go to Morgan Wooten's basketball camp as a camper one summer um, and then going back to work that camp was great. And, and Joe Wooten and the Wooten family. Um, having a chance to, uh, you know, you, you, you read different books, but I thought a really good coach um, that recruited me out of high school a little bit that I got to know and, and did things in a little different way was Dave Nyland, who is the head coach at Penn State Barron. and still is the head coach at Penn State Barron and a terrific coach and has become a really, um, really influential mentor as a coach for me. So uh, wanting to learn from him. I and mean, I took, um, was trying to get in, I wanted to get a coaching opportunity and uh, I drove for my spring break in college. I never went anywhere on spring break, I always went home. But on my way home, I drove from Ithaca, New York, Ithaca College, to Morgantown, West Virginia. But I wanted to see if there was any chance to be like a GA with Dave Nyland. So I drove to Erie, PA, and uh, we'd laugh about it and joke about it. But he, he very much politely gave me the Heisman. It was just like, ah, a good scene. Good luck with things. Right. And, uh, Oh, he, I don't know if he ever stopped moving. He just kind of, hey, it's good. thanks for stopping by, whatever. No, we don't have anything. And just, he's like, I got to go to practice. See ya. <laughs> um, but uh, that was someone, that, you know, that I really liked, um, wanted to learn from. You know, another guy had an opportunity was um, with Coach Hurley uh, and had a, a friend of a friend set up for us to meet and went down to White Eagle in Jersey and watched practice and uh, incredible day and experience there and that would have been a great situation as well so um you just at the time i just wanted to be around good coaches really good basketball coaches and with that idea in mind what advice would you give to uh, college kids who you know are in a similar spot that you were at that time looking to get into the coaching field what would be your main pieces of advice to to kids who eventually have that that dream one day of being a division one basketball coach yeah i think um there's no real path, unfortunately, right? There's a lot of people. It's an incredibly competitive profession where a lot of people want to join um, and be a part of for all great reasons, I think. Um, sometimes they're not great reasons, but I think for the most part, people are trying to do it to help others out. Um, but if you wanted to get into it, the unfortunate part, there isn't a direct, hey, this is what you want to be. If you want to be a doctor, right, you do pre-med, you go to med school, you take, you take the MCATs, you go to med school. Um, if you're a doctor, if you want to be a lawyer, you become a you go to law school, right? There's a very clear cut path here I, in coaching. There's not a clear p- cut path. I do wish I had a little few more tools in my toolbox at this point in time. Um, so I would advise uh, someone who wants to get into coaching to have a minor in psychology um, and understanding um, trying to do as best you can to understand that part of the, um, the development of young men or women. And, uh, so I think that's important, but you just gotta, at that point in time, if you can do something where the level shouldn't be the issue and money shouldn't be the issue, it's find the opportunity where you can do so much when you go to bed at night, you're just exhausted and get up and find that place where you have value. And more importantly, I don't know if others see value from what you do, but you're providing value and you're connected. And uh, I think that's really important. You know, I still have this. There's something that uh, you know, I'm talking to my, my brother and sister who have been incredibly supportive along the way, but it's just a notebook of things, daily to-do lists, monthly, um, things we developed while I was coaching at Army and Cornell. But wherever you go, this is something I've always had. And if you want to build personal relationships uh, with the student athletes to help them mature into well-educated students while you're winning basketball games. And these are three things that I had. And you want to make a contribution, whatever you're getting and being given, you want to make a major contribution to that athletic department. Younger form can be energy, manpower, whatever it is, find a place where you can con- contribute and make an impact and then be involved in the community. And that's certainly something that uh, it's tougher to do right now in a pandemic. Uh, right. But 
but find a place where you can connect and build positive relationships where you can really impact um, that department and be involved in the community. Well, and that, you touched on a I was slightly gonna... broad answer for you there. No, you touched on a lot of really good things. And I kind of want to ask you, because another question I was going to bring up was with how stressful the college basketball season can be, especially for a division one like head coach being the face of a program. What are some of the daily habits, right? That you have to put to practice to keep in mind a lot of those principles that, that you just mentioned, right? Because I'm sure there's points in time where you just, you have to be a psychologist, not just for your, your teammates, but for understanding where you are at certain points in the season, understanding where your coaching yeah. staff is at certain points in the season. So what are some of those habits or, or routines that you try to practice uh, on a daily, weekly basis that keep you running at, at, full, at full energy throughout an entire uh, season for, for yourself? Yeah, I think being intentional with uh, a form of exercise. Um, you never know how much time you have or don't have depending on parts of the year. Um, but trying to be committed to that. Reading, um, spending some time um, in, in some prayer as well. Those are all things that I try and do. There are certainly times where you don't do it as consistently as you'd like, but I think I've found when I'm operating uh, at my best, I'm able to do that. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's funny. I, I was listening to a podcast that Matthew McConaughey was on a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about how, similar to how you keep uh, journals and notes, he keeps notes uh, about his life, a daily journal, and he likes to look back on when things are going wrong so he knows what habits to avoid. But he also really likes looking back on when things were going right for him so he knows what habits to, to kind of practice and get back to that he's gotten away from. So I guess for you, two, two part of there, uh, what habits do you feel you sometimes get away from that work best for you? And what habits do you sometimes fall in the trap of getting into that, that aren't as productive for you? I think the habit – uh, working out is so great. You feel, you feel so much better. Just getting blood moving, you energized. Uh, I think it's great for the brain. I'm sure there's studies that I'm not referencing that you should, but like I know when you spend time with physical activity, you're more efficient and productive and you think more clearly. Right. Um, have you ever watch um, on uh, this is probably a bad example, but I think it'd be funny just to be real more authentic. Uh, Money heist. Is a I great haven't, Netflix. I've heard of it. I haven't seen it though. Yeah, even the professor in his times of like ultimate stress was finding a way to hit the speed bag and get some boxing and get some exercise and going to get his mind thinking a different way. Right, right. Bad example if you haven't seen it though, I guess. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. There's, I guess I got to watch it now. Is that, I could probably find that on Netflix somewhere. Uh, you definitely can. You definitely can. I know a couple. I, uh, my wife and I watched some of it and then uh, a couple of our players, uh, Cam and Zach, were watching it. Yeah, so we started texting each other. So it's it's again. I think you talk about connection is really important. So it, connection doesn't always have to be. Hey, we're talking about Cam Winter and mid range jump shots or ball screen coverage. Right, right. It can be life. It can be life. Well, and then you mentioned connection. Let's let's talk about going into this year since you bring up a couple of your players. This has obviously been such a unique. Uh, experience for everyone this year in 2020. So the challenges that it's presented for you, your coaching staff, your players, uh, what have you guys had to do to adjust to it? What's been the approach this year due to how the pandemic has changed everything for, uh, for the world? Yeah, I'm really proud of the guys. I, I think uh, by and large, um, they've been able to stay connected uh, through a couple different ways. I think they've been able to communicate. Uh, I think our younger guys feel more connected and our younger guys feel um more quick uh part of our team very quickly uh, which is great it's a great job by our vets um and so I, zooms have been good um i don't think anyone's volunteering to jump on a zoom uh for a team meeting or a film session if there's a way we can do it in person so um individual conversations uh, phone calls, a lot of FaceTime. Um, so just having a form of communication. Also, it can just be a text. Like I said, hey, saw this, brought you to mind. Thought of you this morning, thought you'd like this. Um, I, I think that that's can be a really important thing. Um, and I think our guys are excited, you know, and just talking to guys, say, I'm really motivated about this season. 
you go back and forth. I think guys, we, we, we've been building, we've been building in this direction and uh, we understand opportunities we have. Well, and the preseason poll came out and it has you guys listed at third, James and Cam both on the first team. And I know you, you don't like to get too much into the, those kinds of stuff, preseason awards, but uh, it, it does certainly feel as if the, the tide is shifting at Drexel for you five years in now. Uh, obviously you probably had a plan when you first showed up, you had your expectations, certain things were met, certain things weren't, but now five years in, what values do you really think have stuck, right? And, and what do you think now in the last year or two has allowed you guys maybe to turn the tide as you go into this 2021 campaign? Yeah, it's, it's interesting that to, to be in year five, um, I think it's one of the first times we haven't had um, – to lean as much on some early guys heavily and more unknowns, just about everybody that's um, in a possibility to play for us. I think um, without our newcomers, obviously they have a chance to do some things, but all the guys returning have also played and impacted things. And we have a pretty good understanding of what Cam can do. Cam and JB can do, Cam and Zach Walton can do. Right. Uh, we know what Matei Yurich can do, what Train can do. Those guys are no longer in their first or second year. So I think that's getting old. You hear a lot of people say it here. Um, certainly um, get old and stay old is, is kind of the mantra and uh, with grad transfers and things like that. But I think being able to build a little good of a group of guys that the, the center of gravity of our group is now in their third or fourth year in our program, there's an understanding of what we're doing and how we're going about it uh, and, and we try and stay to our our basic core values of appreciating the opportunity gratitude respecting the process to be good respecting your teammates uh and, and competing and try and be at your best you know and um, we try and have a couple words on each one but uh, grc gratitude respect compete i think covers a lot you know and uh, that's everybody in our program and kind of having um, coffee with Chelsea Holmes, our academic coordinator, who's done a terrific job during this time uh, serving our players in, in a virtual way, which is, can you imagine, very difficult in her perspective and her job every day. But, you know, we talk about competing. She says, it's just really simple. Be, try to be your best. doesn't matter whether you're doing a class or you are on the court in the weight room. doesn't matter. Let's compete. Let's be at our best. And uh, I loved how she said that, and that, it's really stuck with me. Well, one final question, Coach, because I know we're cut for time. 20 minutes flies by when we're doing one of these talks. But I do want to ask you because we got into we'll this. Do it again. What's do that? It again. Of course. We'll do it again. Of course. We've got to have you on multiple times. I mean, because the next question I was going to ask you, and we could do a separate podcast just on music taste alone. I know you're a big Zach Brown fan. Uh, Zach Brown fan, <laughs> as am I. So for you, on yeah. those road trips in the middle of a season, you know, you mentioned the different things you got to do. What's on your playlist when you're going through the stresses of a regular season? Some music that you're going to listen to maybe uh, to wow. come back after a long film study or, or a stressful day after practices. What's kind of on your playlist on wine? I'm a Spotify guy, right? And certainly, um, so I'm looking at it as I talk to you. I'm looking at it right here. <laughs> uh, um, sometimes during the season, the challenge is, is getting – good sleep so you got some music to fall asleep to right, right. to uh, sleep in music um but also uh my sons our kids love the show dude perfect of course so any music any music that is played on that show somehow is thrown up on my playlist right now That's funny. Um, but uh yeah not afraid just to go zach brown band a lot um a healthy mix of that i like country i don't love all country but i like some of it and uh, but then also just uh, sometimes I don't necessarily pick a song and just say, hey, throw a uh, throw a mix when we were in college. It's pretty good to go with. Uh, I probably should listen to more music. I'm not I'm not I don't have a good answer for you other than Zach Brown. <laughs> well, I caught you off guard there, but coach, this was a fun. Uh, good. No, good. And uh, I'm listen, I'd love to have you on again. It's always a pleasure talking to you, but I'm really excited for you guys this year. Uh, I, I'm, I'm expecting some good things from you guys. I know you guys are. And I can't wait to see you guys out there on the court in 2021. Thank you, Chris. Um, we'd love to get to that point. We're just a few weeks away. Um, things are, numbers are rising. Um, our guys have been terrific. And uh, just encourage everyone to, as we tell our players every day, right? Wash your hands, wear a mask, keep your distance.
right? Stay healthy, do everything you can. And uh, hopefully we put ourselves in a situation where we can uh, play some games and have some success on the floor.